I just like to uh, add a little word. We have to realize <coughs> the whole chapter three is a uh, parenthesis. In this parenthetical uh, uh, word, Paul uh, beseech or uh, exhort us, the saints, to uh, have a walk worthy of God's calling. For such an exhortation, he just gives himself to us as an example. Right? You have to consider what he has mentioned concerning himself in this whole chapter is just a pattern. He sets up himself to us as a pattern. How to work mercy of God's calling. To work mercy of God's calling is, number one, to be a prisoner of the Lord. And number two, to be a steward. A steward. And number three, to be a minister. Right? In this chapter, you see Paul uh, illustrated himself as a prisoner, a steward, and a minister. As a prisoner, <coughs> while he is or he was being imprisoned or confined in Christ, he saw the vision. He saw the vision. The more he saw the vision, the more he what? Gained Christ. The more he experienced Christ. Then he became the steward to serve others, to serve the household of God. With what? With the riches of Christ. With the riches of God. By doing this, he was the dispenser of God. The steward just means the dispenser. Dispensing God to God's children. Then what? Then he was a good minister. Ministering Christ to all the members of the body of Christ that Christ may be fully expressed through this body. This is to walk mercy of the calling. My have you seen how high is such a work? Right? To work mercy of God's calling is just not to be nice, to be uh, 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 kind, to be humble, to be gentle, mild, loving, and so forth. It's just not that much. That's too low. Right? To work mercy of God's calling is to be in prison. Right? To be in the confinement of uh, Christ. That here within Christ, you see the vision. You see the revelation. Then you know Christ. Then you gain Christ. Then you experience Christ. Then Christ will be wrought into a whole being and you become a steward, a serving one, serving God's household, dispensing God into all of them, then you become the dispenser of God, and then you become a good minister, ministering all the riches of Christ to his members that the body may be built up. I tell you, this is the work that, that is worthy of God's calling. I hope that we all may realize that we have to be imprisoned in Christ, that we may see him more, that we may experience him more, that we may serve people more with him, that we become a good minister, ministering Christ to all the people. Thank you, brothers. Now, I would ask section B to read to us Chapter 3, verses 3 through 11. Let us turn to message 29. 
the revelation of the mystery. <coughs> Would you please all stand up and read verses 3 through 11. And we ought to follow closely. To uh, check with you. Don't you love this version? Yes. I tell you the truth, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy to have such a version. This morning, after the uh, stewardship of grace, we have to see the revelation of the mystery. I believe among us through the years this matter of revelation should have been made more than clear to all of us. Right? Revelation is just a kind of a unveiling. You see, look at me. Something is veiled. Right? And what is revelation? Revelation is just unveiling. Uh, the unveiling, taking off the veil. The New Testament is the revelation of God's New Testament economy. And this economy was a mystery hidden through the ages, hidden from eternity, through so many ages. If you go to Adam and ask Adam, what uh, is God's economy? God, what is God's economy? I believe Adam would uh, tell you, he didn't know. He didn't know. He saw a dog, and he gave that animal the name dog. You see? And he saw a cat, and he gave this little animal the name cat. But he didn't know what was God's economy. He didn't know. I must tell you the truth. I'm not proud. Even you would go to Moses. Even he didn't know. And no doubt Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, including Joseph, all these forefathers, none of them knew what was God's economy. You even go to Samuel, the prophet, and David, the king. You go to that great prophet Isaiah. 
and with Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all these, if you go to Zechariah and you ask him what was God's economy, the Lord would tell you they didn't know. Hallelujah. We know. Yeah. Why? Because during their time, there was what? The veiling time. The veiling time. The economy of God was veiled, was discovered by a veil, not unveiled to them yet. You see? So it was a mystery. It just was a mystery. No doubt, the Spirit of God did work within them, did work among them, but anyhow, by that time, this economy of God, the dispensing, the dispensing of God himself into human beings to produce a body to the Son of God. And you have to realize who is the Son of God. He is the very embodiment of God. And God's this economy is to dispense himself into a great number of human beings to produce a body to this embodiment. The Son of God is the very embodiment of God. And this embodiment needs a body, needs an increase, needs an expansion. And how could this expansion be produced by God dispensing himself into his chosen people? We all have to see this. I tell you, this is the biggest, the greatest mystery in the whole universe. In the whole universe, this is hidden. I tell you today, even today, even today many great men, many uh, great dig dignitaries, the president, the kings, the uh, prime ministers, even they didn't know, even they don't know still. Yet what? What a mercy, we know. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even this morning in this room, some young sisters, young girls, just 16 years of age, she knows something which many presidents don't know. The great men didn't know. Plato didn't know. Confucius didn't know. Those great philosophers, none of them got to know. But hallelujah. Amen. Little sisters, I say again, you know. Amen. Don't you know? Amen. You know. You know what? You know God's economy is to dispense into so many God-chosen people to produce a body as the increase, as the expansion of the embodiment of God for a full expression of God in this universe. I tell you, nothing is bigger than this. Nothing is more important than this. We do not only know, hallelujah, we are in it. We are not only in it, and we are it. Am I right? We know it, we are in it, and we are it. Amen. This is the thing that was hidden from eternity through all the ages until Jesus came. Until Jesus came, this was hidden there. And this was a mystery. A mystery. But today, it is no more a mystery to us. Today, it is an unveiling. It is an unveiling. Uh, it is a revelation. <clears throat> I do believe by uh, 
seen so much, you surely got to know what is the revelation and what is the mystery. Here it says, the revelation of this mystery was revealed to the apostles and prophets. And this morning, I would puzzle you, firstly, with these two kinds of persons, apostles and prophets. I would puzzle you in this way. Do you believe the apostles and the prophets are great men? Say yes or no. You okay. can You see, two answers. One is yes, one is no. Let me check again. Do you all consider the apostles and the prophets as great men? Yes, yes or no? no. Yes. I still hear no. <laughs> so the answer or the answers are not unique. Some say yes, some say no. Let me repeat again. <laughs> Here, <laughs> Ephesians 3 says clearly the revelation of God's mystery was revealed to the apostles and prophets. According to such a record, we should consider the apostles and the prophets not ordinary people, right? They got to be something extraordinary. Am I, am I right? So based upon this kind of concept, surely they should be considered as great men. No. <laughs> but still some brothers are so strong. I just couldn't convince them. Okay, you just tell them why no. <laughs> they were in spirit. Huh? Because they were in spirit. They did. It was the grace of God. And we can all be uh, listen, listen. Both in spirit and uh, of grace of God, these kind of arguments mean nothing. <laughs> <laughs> why? If you say they are great men because they are in spirit. I would check you, are you not in spirit this morning? You are. You are in spirit. So if they are great men because they, were, they are in spirit, so you must be also great men. Because you are also in spirit. And if you say they are great men because they receive the grace of God, I would ask you, don't you receive the grace of God? We all receive the grace of God. So, brother, what's your argument to say no? In Ephesians 3, 8, uh, Paul, Paul, the apostle, claims he's the, he's the last of, the right. least of all saints. Have you heard? Stand up and tell us. <laughs> Stand up, brother. Come up. <laughs> and give us a sermon. <laughs> <laughs> A sermon text pound, Ephesians 8, 3. 3, 8. 3, 8. <laughs> <laughs> sure you are right. We don't have chapter, t chapter 8, right? Okay. Ephesians 3, 8. According to uh, Ephesians 3, 8, Paul, one of the apostles, Listen to this. says to me, less than the least of all saints right. was this grace given. Right. So there Paul was less, he just wasn't a great man then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Paul wasn't a great man, great man because he was less. He was less than the least of all the saints. So it is hard to say whether they were great men or they were not. If you say they were, I say no. 
If you say they were not, I probably would say yes. <laughs> it's hard. Now, let's see this. There should be a reason. In no other book, Paul <coughs> tells us that he was less than the least of all the saints. He did say that he was the last among all the apostles. He did say this in 1 Corinthians, right? But here he says he was less. He was less than the least of all the saints. That young brother who gave a test was right in saying, in Greek, the word less is the word that means least. Least is the smallest. And here you have the smallest. <laughs> that is someone smaller than the smallest. Smaller than the smallest. The lister. The less than the least. It is surely quite meaningful. And I do believe purposeful. That the apostle put, put such a verse into this section. Without this verse, I tell you, even I myself would be induced to say, the apostles were great men. The prophets were great men. But just by this verse, verse 8, that says, Paul was less than the least of all the saints. Why he put this verse here? Because... He was exhorting us to have a walk worthy of God's calling by setting up himself as example. If he didn't put in this verse, we would take a skills. We would say, Paul, sure, you can do it. You can do it, right? You are such a great apostle, right? You can do it, but how could we do it? We are so small, and you are so great, and we are so small. How could we do it? So Paul put in this verse to shut up the mouth of excuse. Indicating that saints don't think I, Paul, was greater than you. No, I was less than you. As less than you, I could do it then you are greater than me, sure, you can do it more. So no excuse. You just don't have any excuse. If Paul could have that kind of grace, we all can. If Paul could have that kind of life, we all can. If Paul could walk worthily of God's calling, we also can. No excuse. Forget about today's Christianity. I'm right. Today's Christianity not only make Peter a saint. No, saint, my goodness, saint. To the first heaven is saint, Saint Teresa. And Saint this and Saint that. They are the saints. We are turtles. Some are even goofers. Am I right? right? But in Paul's writing, you look at Romans. Paul says, all believers are saints. You are a saint. Not only Teresa was a saint. Whether he was a saint, not, I doubt. I, I really put a question mark upon her. People say, 
Francesco was a saint. I would say he was just a poor monk. Some monks in China were poorer than Francisco. You, do you know what I mean? You all are saints. Amen. Saints? Amen. I call you saints this morning. Amen. You all are saints. Amen. Right? You have to drop Christianity concept. We are not inferior to Paul. And Paul are not superior to us. Paul was not. He was even less than we. If he could walk in such a way to uh, express Christ, to minister Christ, to be such a prisoner, such a steward, and such a minister. Surely we all can. Now, you may argue with me, Brother Lee, you see, the apostles. Oh, the apostles. But let me tell you, I don't believe you all know the meaning of the word apostle in Greek. The meaning is not that high. It's very common. It means what? The sent one. The one sent. If this morning you send me, you send me to go to Los Angeles, then I become your apostle. Right? If I send you to my home to pick up my Bible, you are my sent one. You are my apostle. Right? You are my apostle to pick up my Bible. The apostle simply means the one sent. Of course, now sent by whom? Sent by God. Sent by God. In the New Testament, first thing, John the Baptist was sent. But he, should been, he shouldn't be considered as the first sent one fully in the New Testament economy. He was in the tran transitional period, right? But the one who was the first fully sent by God for the New Testament economy was Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ was the first apostle sent by God. Then he sent another 12, right? Another 12 apostles. But listen, Christians used to have a wrong concept. Only those 12 were sent, and the others were not sent. Now, I would turn you to John chapter 20. Let's read a few verses from John 20. John 20 from verse 19. Let me read to you. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the apostles, be careful, where the apostles were assembled. Who? Not apostles, disciples. That means the believers were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus stood and stood in their midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so, so said, he showed unto them his hand and his sight. Then were the disciples, not apostles, glad. When they saw the Lord, then said Jesus to them, Again, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me. That means making me the apostle. Even so, sent I you. You just tell me, who are you? 
the apostles? The disciples, right? And when he said, he has said this, he breathed into them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now you can see all the disciples are the sent ones. Every believer is a sent one. I don't like to uh, promote you. I don't like to uh, uplift you, making you proud. But I like to tell you, actually, everyone among us, in the least, is a sent one. I see young sister again. Young sister, when you go to your school, you may be still 12 years of age. You go to school, and you tell your teacher, and you tell your schoolmates, classmates, ministering Christ to them, don't you realize that you are the one sent by the Lord? We have a little female apostle there, 12 years of age, a young apostle, female, only 12 years of age, say It seems you ought are not to say it. One day, when you go, or when you went to your cousin with a burden to share Christ with him, you just tell me by that time, were you not a sinned one? Were you not one sinned by Christ? Say it, yes or no? Yes. You are a sent one. I tell you, at least you are an apostle to your cousin. Even one day, you got the burden from your bedroom and to go to your mother's bedroom. And said something to mother. Mother, I have a burden to share Christ with you. By that time, were you not a sent one? By Christ from your bedroom to your mother's bedroom? Were you not a sent one? I tell you, right by that hour, you are an apostle. You may say, oh, brother Lee. <laughs> This is too much. <laughs> I say, yeah, I don't care whether this is too much or this is not much, but I care for the fact. When you went to your mother with a burden to minister Christ to her, I tell you, surely you were the sent one by the Lord. In a very good sense, we are all of the apostles. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I know this morning I brew up your mentality. <laughs> Causing the trouble. And how? So take it. Take the dose. Now we go to the prophets. Poor, poor Christian today. The all thing the prophets is just like this. Thus said the Lord. <laughs> My people, the time is short. I am coming with great power. You should get yourself ready for my coming. Thus said the Lord. Or... My people, there'll be a great earthquake <laughs> in Los Angeles, <laughs> and the South California will fall into the ocean. <laughs> Thus says the Lord. <laughs> I tell you, this is today's Christian concept about a prophet. But I tell you, no need to say 
according to the Bible, even according to history. In the ancient time, the word prophet is used in what meaning? In the meaning as a, a spokesman. You know, when Moses was called by God, sent by God as an apostle, you know, in Hebrew chapter 3, verse 1, it does say, right? And in verse 2, also say, what? That Moses was an apostle, typifying Christ coming to be God's sent one. Moses was an apostle. While well, God was calling him and sending him to be such an apostle, he was timid. Right? He was timid, saying, oh, I don't have the eloquence. I don't know how to speak. I'm stammering. stammering. Then God said, okay, okay, I give you your brother Aaron as your what? Prophet. As your prophet. Aaron was given by God to Moses as his prophet. Not to predict something, but just to speak for Moses, to be the spokesman of Moses. By that you can see the prophet always goes along with the apostle. Moses was the apostle and Aaron was the prophet. How about this? How about this? I just would brew your mind again. Brew up your mind again. You all have to realize when you go to the school, on the one hand, you are an apostle. Then when you up, open up your mouth to speak, you are a prophet. How about this? New concept, right? Oh. Ooh. Ooh. I sure it would uh, make you all to be so proud. Going out with the people in the recovery, everyone is an apostle. Everyone is also a prophet. We all are prophets as well as apostles. Why? Don't argue with me. You don't have the case. I care for the facts. Okay. Young sister, suppose you go to your mother with a burden to minister Christ to your mother. We have proved already that you are a sent one. Right? You are one sent by the Lord. By that time, if you are not at other time, but by that time, sure you are. You are an apostle. Right? Then you open up your mouth. You open up your mouth. You don't speak anything for yourself. You speak something for Christ. I tell you, by that time, you are not only an apostle, but also what? A prophet. Day by day, we are apostles. Day by day, we are prophets. I tell you, if you have been a Christian for years, you never went to someone with a burden to minister Christ to others. It's a shame. And you have been a Christian for years, Yet you have never spoken something for Christ to people. It's a shame. And this means what? This means you are a poor believer, not being an apostle, neither being a prophet. I tell you, a standard believer, a believer up to the standard, a normal believer should be an apostle and a prophet.
I know, I know, I know your mentality has been poisoned. Sorry to say this. When you hear this, oh, you're just like this. Oh, oh, this is too much. I tell you, this is all to get too less. Too little, not too much. Let me check with you. <clears throat> I don't mean the elders among us. I don't mean the co-workers among us. I just mean you, young brothers, young sisters, using a, a slang term, the little potatoes. I just use the little potatoes. Some of you young brothers, some of you young sisters, under the Lord's sovereignty, one day uh, you will move to a new city, small city, right? To a new city, a small city. And you will go there. And you will go there with a burden, not just to do a job, to make a living, but you go there with a burden. Right? With a burden to uh, bring God to people, uh, to uh, minister Christ to people. And you go and you stay there for about a few years. I tell you, in the first two months, uh -huh, you what? Minister Christ to two or three. Right? And then gradually, you minister Christ to more of the people. Listen to this. And after maybe a couple of years, there will be six or five, uh, ten or eight. Uh -huh. All got infused by you with Christ. They all become what? Fellow believers with you. Uh-huh. How about that? How about that? You tell me. How about that? Will that not be a church there? A little church? You say it? Will that not be a little church there? You say it. Then you just tell me who raised up that church? Who raised up that church? Who established that church? You, the apostle. <laughs> you, the apostle. Think this about. Think this. Think this. <sighs> well, you are being an apostle there, the sent one by God. You speak day by day for God. By this way, you just tell me, are you not a prophet? Are you not a prophet? Are you not a spokesman of God? Sure you are. Why I spend so much time in this one thing? Because of the background of Christianity. Due to Catholicism. Oh, Catholicism made Peter so high. And made the Pope so high. Am I right? And made, make all those people in the so-called holy service so high. The holy service is not that high. We all are in the holy service. Right? I would say everyone is a Pope. <laughs> Everyone is a pope. Everyone is a great prophet. How about this? Based upon what I say this? Based upon this fact, everyone believer is a sinner. 
If you are not a sinned one, you are not faithful. You are not obedient. Am I right? If you are really faithful and obedient, surely day by day you are a sinned one. We know today in Mongolia, in Mongolia, there's nearly not a church there. At least very few. Okay, suppose, suppose either Brother Yu or Sister Yu will be sovereignly led by the Lord to go to Mongolia. And you will go there not just to have a living under the snow. <laughs> right? And that's not your burden. You will go there with a burden to what? To bring Christ to that heathen country and to minister Christ to so many pagans. I'm right? And you pray for them. I tell you, God never answers prayer so fastly as to this kind of prayer. If any one of you be led to go to Mongolia and pray for the salvation there, God surely will answer your prayer. Maybe after half a year, 20 will be brought to the Lord by you. Then you just tell me, ha <laughs> ha. Who are you? You have to boast. Brother Lee, I am the apostle. <laughs> I am the Pope. <laughs> I'm the apostle and the Pope sent by God to Mongolia. <laughs> and at the same time, I am the prophet. You think over, are you not the prophet? Because there, day by day, no one speaks for God. Only you. You are the unique spokesman of God, speaking for God day and night. Do you think I'm joking? Who are you? Who are you? Just an ordinary believer. The least among all the saints in the Lord recovery. Yet, when you go to Mongolia, you will be the Pope. There. You will be the Apostle. You will be the Prophet. You know what the word Pope means, right? Papa, and Father, Daddy. So, when you go to Mongolia, you bring so many new ones to the Lord, you become their Papa. Right? You become their papa. You beget them with Christ. So you become their father. Now, Jainga got convinced. <laughs> when she heard, I said, that everyone might be Pope. Oh, in God's mentor. Mental concept got blown up. When I gave him the explanation that all the Mongolian believers will be begotten by this young brother, I'm sure this young brother is daddy, is the papa, is the pope. Now, Zhang says, now I said, okay. <laughs> Well, I like to say something in order to de-drug you. You all got drug. Am I right? You all got drug. Hallelujah. This morning, maybe just by this message, you all got de -drug. Oh, I'm not joking. Dear ones, we all are the apostles. And we all have to be the apostles. And we all have to be the prophets because day by day we must be the sent ones. 
Some of your sisters are nurses in the clinics, in the hospitals. Do you believe God just wants you to be a nurse in the clinic? No. By appointing you there, God sends you in the clinic. God sends you to the hospital. In the hospital, you are God's sent one. You are God's apostle. Am I right? And you are at the same time, in the hospital, in the clinic, you are God's spokesman. And to some extent, I can testify, in many occasions, God's authority has been all the time with this kind of person. If you do practice the apostleship in your hospitality, realizing and practicing that you are the sent one from God, and you are speaking for God, in many occasions, God will be with you as your authority. Why we Christians in many occasions, don't have the authority because we don't practice our apostleship. Now, coming to apostleship, your mind consider apostles. Oh, apostleship. That high. I don't mean that high. Apostleship simply means being sent. Right? You have to practice your being sent. You have been sent. And you are still being sent, sent by God to the school, to the hospital, yeah, to your auntie's home. Am I right? Sent you there to minister Christ to others. By what? By being the prophet, by speaking, by speaking Christ and by speaking, speaking for Christ. So by this way, we all can see we all are apostles and we all are prophets. But listen, the apostles and the prophets, they have a sign. They have a proof, P-R-O-O-F. They have a sign, a proof that they are the apostles and they are the prophets. What sign? Revelation. They have the revelation. I tell you, when you go to your mother without revelation, you are not an apostle. You are not a prophet. Now, when you go to your mother and tell her mother, I am your daughter, but started to say, I know Christ, mother. You don't know. Of course, you don't need to speak so proudly, right? But anyhow, you have to let her know that you see something of Christ. She doesn't, right? You see something of Christ. She doesn't. And this indicates what? This indicates you have a revelation. Right? You go to your cousins and tell them that you see something of Christ which they don't see. I'm right? I tell you, as long as you have such a revelation which they don't have, you are what? An apostle. You are a prophet. Consider it. This is considered. How about this? Young sisters, you may be just 15 years of age. You may ask me, brother, how I dare to say that I am the sent one by God and I am God's spokesman. I would say, wha, wha, how, how you dare to say this? Because you have the revelation. And your father may be a doctor degree professor in physics. And you have to say, Father, even you know so much of the conscience, uh, uh, science, but you don't know anything about Christ. Yet I, your daughter, know. I know Christ. 
I've seen the revelation. Christ revealed to me. Christ is my life. Christ lives me. Oh, Christ is one with me. Oh, Christ is my everything. Oh, daddy, let me tell you so much I have seen of Christ. I tell you, as long as you have such a revelation, you know what? You are the apostle. You are the prophet. Why? Because you have the revelation. You have the revelation. And the revelation concerning what? Concerning Christ and the church. Saints, this morning, I would tell with you all, don't you see something of Christ? Don't you something concern the church? You do. So go to your cousins, right? Go to your relatives. Go to your folks. You do have something to tell them. As long as you have such a revelation, you are what? You are the apostles. You are the prophets. Our time is nearly gone. Now, let's go on. Of course, here it says, in spirit. <laughs> Not in your mentality, neither in your will, nor in your emotion. Right? Don't go to your mother too emotionally. Be super. And tell her your revelation. And tell her what you have seen of Christ. Tell her what you have experienced of Christ in your spirit. I tell you, here is a principle. Only the emotion can touch the emotion. Only the mind can touch the mind. Only the will can touch the will. In the same principle, only the spirit can touch the spirit. If you go to your mother, your cousins, to speak something from your emotion, you could never touch their spirit. You must be in the spirit. Then whatever you say out from your spirit will touch their spirit. Only the things from the spirit will reach the spirit. Then, concerning Christ and the church. My, the apostle, the prophets, they saw the revelation. Not concerning the seven horns. Not concerning how many eyes. But concerning Christ and the church. We need this kind of revelation that we can dispense, minister, right? Christ to others. Then we go on. Uh, the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ, this is hidden in other generations, but revealed in the New Testament age. We all know this. We covered this already. And this mystery of Christ is just the church. The mystery of Christ is the church, the body of Christ. And this church, the body of Christ, uh, with the nations, that means with the believing Gentiles, as joint heirs and joint partakers of the promise. Joint heirs, means we all are of this home, same, same home with the same father. Joint partakers of the promise, that means we all participate all in the blessings promised by God in the Old Testament. And such a church at the body of Christ is produced with the unsearchable riches of Christ. We will cover this maybe in the next message. And this church, this body of Christ, is for expressing the multifarious wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the Gentiles. 
We will also cover this in one, in one message. And this is all according to the eternal purpose which God made in Christ. This is to have the church at the body of Christ, at the mystery of Christ, is altogether according to God's eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ in eternity past. And this is all for what? For dispensation of God. I just stop here and I leave the rest of the time for your sharing. Now, I would uh, just uh, ask section F next to E, section F this morning to uh, take care of the sharing. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on social media or visit our website for more from Living Stream Ministries.